Um, so it's a pleasure to introduce our next speaker, one of the newer members of the Department of Pharmacology, Dr. Noah Noy. Um, Dr. Noy has a very interesting scientific training. Um, she obtained her PhD from Tel Aviv University, uh, majoring, uh, looking at the, uh, uh, doing uh, work on geophysics and planetary sciences. Uh, she was looking at the chemistry of the atmospheres of um, um, Jupiter and Saturn's moon. But lucky for us in the nuclear receptor field, she decided to go back to the biological sciences and she did postdocs at Weizmann's Institute, um, UCSF, and Cornell. She also took faculty position at Cornell University. Um, she moved up to the ranks to full professor and she moved to Case uh, 2007. Um, her work focusing on small lipid hormones and nutrients and the title of her talk is um, Nuclear Receptors and Lipid Binding Proteins as Mediators of Hormone Action. Noah? Okay, good morning everybody. This is a great honor to participate in this day. It's promising to be not only very interesting but also already has been useful. So um, I, I'm, I truly appreciate this opportunity to share with you some of our recent findings on the functions of two um, protein families, nuclear hormone receptors and lipid binding proteins uh, in, in the transcriptional activities of um, hydrophobic hormones. And so in principle, um, cellular cells can respond to external signaling by two, type, two types of general mechanisms. So for example, hydrophobic hormones and growth factors such as insulin cannot penetrate the plasma membranes and they bind in cells to cell surface receptors. And upon binding, a signal can be propagated from this receptor to the inside of the cell and often this is transduced to the uh, nucleus to regulate gene expression. I'm not going to talk about this at all. On the other hand, lipophilic hormones uh, can uh, go, can get into the cell through the plasma membranes, and so sometimes these hormones just simply arrive at the cell in this fashion. Sometimes a precursor will arrive at the cell and will be activated by metabolic transformation. And these hydrophobic hormones can get to the nucleus and directly bind to transcription factor to activate the uh, um, their transcriptional activity. And so some such uh, lipophilic hormones are on the slide and some of them are very immediately recognizable. And so here is estradiol, testosterone, cortisol, steroid receptors, thyroid hormone functions in this way, vitamin D functions in this way, uh, some um, cholesterol derivatives function in this way. And also uh, our favorite molecule, all transretinoic acid and nine cis retinoic acid, these are vitamin A metabolites. And the way that these compounds function is by binding to specific members of a superfamily of transcription factors known as nuclear hormone receptors. And these have been recently classified by evolutionary consideration into six subfamilies. There are 48 genes that encode for nuclear receptors in the human. There are 49 in the mouse. Uh, there are over 20 in insects and for some unknown reason, there are over 270 genes that encode for different nuclear receptors in C. elegans. Uh, another way to classify nuclear receptors um, is in this fashion, and in fact, this is much more useful for the sake of what we're talking about today. And so, nuclear hormone receptor can be classified into steroid receptors, estrogen, progesterone, glucocorticoids, and uh, the likes. Um, subclass family two is non-steroid receptors, and these are proteins that respond to hormones such as retinoids, thyroid hormone, vitamin D, long-chain fatty acid, cholesterol, etc. And the third class of receptors is classified as orphans in order to denote that we do not know the ligands that activate them in vivo. Now, some of these proteins may be true orphans. In other words, they might act as constitutively active transcription factors and do not require a ligand for function, but some of them might uh, be regulated by ligand, but we simply don't know the ligand. I'm going to talk today specifically about this subclass uh, um, hormone receptors. These are non-steroid receptors, and they contain protein uh, that, that, that uh, are shown here, such as the retinoic acid receptor, VDR, thyroid hormone receptor, etc. An interesting feature of this subclass is that they all bind to DNA as dimers, and they all choose a single common binding partner, 
known as the retinoid X receptor, which is also a subclass to our non-steroid uh, nuclear receptors, and it is in self-activated by a vitamin A metabolite, the 9-cis isomer of retinoic acid. And so this is sort of very interesting because RxR being a master regulator allows for integration of different hormonal signals at the level of the genome. And so for example, the RxR VDR complex gives you a machinery that uh, uh, will respond to vitamin D as well as to vitamin A. I'm gonna talk only about two RxR heterodimers today. And this is the RxR RER heterodimer and the RxR PPAR heterodimer. And let me just give you a brief in, uh, introduction to these receptors. So the retinoic acid receptors are activated by the old trans isomer of retinoic acid. Uh, there are three such genes, alpha, beta, and gamma. They, are, they play key roles in embryonic development. In the adult, they regulate a myriad of, of biological functions, including metabolism, differentiation, cell cycle control, and apoptosis. Now, the ability of RARs when activated by retinoic acid to induce differentiation, cell cycle arrest, and apoptosis underlies the anticarcinogenic activities of retinoic acid, which I will talk about today. And uh, some clinical applications for retinoic acid are um, most profoundly this molecule cures promyleocytic leukemia. In fact, 80% uh, um, cure uh, at a five to six years is, is induced by retinoic acid. This is very unusual in cancer treatment. Uh, but retinoic acid is also in trials for other cancers, and it's in uh, use in dermatological disorders such as acne and the most uh, important dermatological disorder, wrinkling in old age. And <laughs> peroxisome proliferator activated receptors, again, uh, there are three types of them, alpha, alpha uh, um, gamma, and delta. Delta is also sometimes called beta, and we will not get into the gossip of that. They're activated by um, various long chain fatty acids and metabolites of fatty acids, such as prostaglantins uh, and leukotrienes but they're truly really orphan receptors because they are activated by these compounds in cultured cell models, but we do not know that these ligands function in vivo. Okay, PPAR alpha is expressed in liver and in heart most highly. It's involved in fatty acid oxidation, lipid metabolism, and synthetic compounds that activate this receptor known as fibrates are in current use in treatment of hyperlipidemia. PPAR gamma is a key regulator of lipid and sugar homeostasis, insulin sensitivity, and adipocyte differentiation. And uh, synthetic ligands that activate PPAR gamma uh, are in current use in treatment of type 2 diabetes. And they're being considered for treatment of atherosclerosis and cancer. So these are really uh, important nuclear receptors that are important targets for therapeutic uh, uh, strategy. PPAR delta has been the most difficult one to find a specific function for because it's ubiquitously expressed. But uh, recent observations have shown that it's involved in differentiation, especially in keratinocytes, and that in keratinocytes, it supports survival and proliferation during wound uh, repair in these cells. Okay. And so just very briefly, in a very simplistic fashion, I want to tell you how these receptors work. So these are the players. Your small hydrophobic hormones will bind to these RxR heterodimers, which will then associate with chromatin. And there are a variety of classes of co-regulators that will then associate with the chromatin-associated nuclear receptor to bridge to the general transcription machinery and, and, and uh, kick in transcription. And so again, very briefly, in the non-liganded states, nuclear receptors, unlike steroid receptors, subclass two nuclear receptors, are in the nucleus and associated with DNA even in the absence of hormone. They are associated with co-repressors, which have enzymatic activity that compact chromatin, thereby actively repressing transcription. Upon ligand binding, uh, the receptors undergo a very dramatic conformational change. Repressors dissociate, co-activators are recruited to the spot, and these contain enzymatic activity that would loosen up chromatin structure by modifying histones uh, and will uh, prepare the region for transcription. And a second class of co-activators known as mediators will then associate with liganded receptors and bridge to the general transcription machinery to initiate transcription. Okay. 
Now, a lot has been discovered over the last few years about the nature and the specific functions and the specificity of these co-regulators, and I'm not going to talk about this today. I do want, however, to turn your attention to another problem in uh, um, transcriptional signaling by, by uh, hydrophobic hormones. So here is a hydrophobic hormone, for example, retinoic acid, and it's generated in the cytosol, and it is water insoluble or very poorly soluble in water, being a hydrophobic hormone. And the question comes about how a poorly soluble molecule makes its way through the aqueous milieu of cytosol and nucleus to reach its target uh, nuclear receptor uh, in the nucleus. And so now I want to introduce you to another family of uh, proteins. These are called intracellular lipid binding proteins. They're very pretty proteins. They're very small. And so you do not need cell-free systems in order to express them. Um, they, they are 14 kilodalton in size, and they, are of, of, they form a beta clam arrangement that makes a ligand binding pocket. This happens to be brain fatty acid binding protein with a fatty acid sitting in the pocket. And they have a helix loop helix that caps over the entrance to the ligand binding site. And there are 14 such proteins in mammals. Some of them are retinoid binding proteins. They bind retinol as well as retinoic acid. And there are nine known fatty, uh, uh, fatty acid binding proteins. The old terminology named them by the tissue in which they're highly expressed, such as liver FABP, intestinal FABP, heart FABP, et cetera. But this is very misleading because they're, all, they're also expressed elsewhere. And so the new terminology is just a number system. Okay. Um, all right. Now it turns out that intracellular lipid binding proteins are known to be cytosolic protein and for very many years, they've been known for 30 years and people have believed that their main function is to solubilize and protect their hydrophobic ligands uh, in cytosol. It turns out, however, that if this, for example, is cellular retinoic acid binding protein, it is indeed cytosolic in the absence of retinoic acid, but when you add retinoic acid, it undergoes a very dramatic nuclear localization. Now, I just want to remind you, retinoic acid is the ligand that activates the transcription factor, RER. Similarly, an intracellular lipid binding protein called fatty acid binding protein 4 is uh, um, partitions between the cytosol and the nucleus in the absence of hormone. But when you treat the cells with a ligand that activates the nuclear receptor P par gamma, it immediately moves into the nucleus. And here is another one. This is uh, fatty acid binding protein 5, which moves to the nucleus in response to a synthetic ligand that activates another type of P par, P par delta. We could show further that what ha once in the nucleus, what these binding proteins do is they directly bind to a very specific nuclear receptor to form a short-lived complex that mediates the uh, uh, movement of the ligand from the binding protein to the receptor. So this water-insoluble ligand never has to see water. Okay. Uh, after ligand transfer, the, re uh, the, re uh, the receptor undergoes its very famous conformational change and the complex dissociates. Okay. As a result of the ability of the binding proteins to directly deliver ligands to nuclear receptor, they appear to facilitate their transcriptional activity. So here, for example, is a transcriptional activation assay looking at the activity of P par gamma. And you can see that FABP4 enhances the transcriptional activity of P par gamma. FABP5 enhances the transcriptional activity of P par delta. And cellular retinoic acid binding protein 2 enhances the transcriptional activity of RER. And this is all very specific and selective for particular binding protein nuclear receptor pairs. Okay. So this brings us to a mystery. This is a structural mystery. So FABP4, as I said, undergoes nuclear localization in response to a ligand. Turns out that it also is actively exported in the nuclear, from the nucleus. And so we went looking for signals that will direct the subcellular localization of this protein. Now, classical nuclear localization signals are usually comprised of a sequence of basic amino acid residues, lysines and arginine, as shown here. Classical nuclear export signals are usually uh, a stretch of leucines or hydrophobic amino acids. And it turns out that when you look at the primary sequence of all intracellular lipid binding proteins, you cannot find sequences like this anywhere. 
And so this is a mystery because we know for a fact that the protein goes to the nucleus in response to lighting. So it turns out that indeed there is no uh, localization signals that you can find in the primary sequence, but if you look at the three-dimensional structure of the protein, you can easily re recognize them. So here is the nuclear localization signal of FABP4, and you can see these lysines and arginines come together to form a compact patch, which is very, very, very reminiscent of the classical nuclear localization signal. These residues are not adjacent in the primary sequence, but they come together in the uh, three-dimensional form. Similarly, you can recognize a nuclear export signal, a bunch of leucines that come together to form a motif that mediates export, is not together in the primary sequence, but come together in the three-dimensional fold. And if you mutate these uh, sequences, you can see mutation the nuclear localization signal results in a protein that's excluded from the, pro the nucleus. Mutation of the export signal uh, accumulates the protein in the nucleus. Okay. And so that brings us to another. Now, this is an interesting structural genomics kind of an observation, because it turns out that you cannot always identify particular protein motifs simply by looking at the primary uh, sequence. But if you go and look at the three-dimensional folds, you can find uh, um, um, known motifs that will help you figure out the function of a protein. Okay, now here is another interesting structural mystery regarding uh, fatty acid binding protein four. So it turns out that all fatty acid binding proteins will bind very many lipid-like molecules but they will only move to the nucleus in response to very particular compounds. And so, for example, if you look at the binding affinity of FABP4 for a PPAR gamma ligand, a PPAR delta ligand, a run-of-the-mill fatty acid, and a fluorescent probe, you can see that they, the protein binds all of these compounds with very similar affinities, but it only mobilizes to the nucleus in response to a PPAR gamma ligand. And so the question comes about, what is the structural feature that allowed this protein to selectively be activated by a particular ligand? And so we solved the crystal structure of FABP4 with this activating ligand troglitazone and compared this to the very, very, very many uh, uh, previously reported structures of this protein in the presence of non-activating ligand. And a really cute story emerged. Okay. So it turns out in the helix loop helix region of the protein, there's a single phenylalanine, F57, which is situated like this in a non-activated complex, but folds over like this in the activating uh, form. If you look at this uh, F57, the crystal structure suggests that it, in this folded form, it pushes on this valine, which then transduces a signal to the area where the nuclear localization signal is. This results in dissociation of protein dimers. So here is the dimer of the protein in the non-activating configuration. The nuclear localization signal is sequestered in the dimeric interface. Upon activation, by folding over, over F57, transducing the signal to the surface, this dimer dissociates, allowing the nuclear localization signal to now be exposed and allowing the protein to move to the nucleus. And so we have a pretty good idea of what intracellular lipid binding proteins do, or these anyway. They pick up a ligand in the cytosol, they move to the nucleus, they deliver the ligand to a particular transcription factor, and they go away. And the question comes about, does this have any biological significance? And so in order to ask this question, we turn to a very important biological activity of retinoic acid, because as I told you, it's an anticarcinogenic agent, and the way that it uh, exerts its anticarcinogenic activity is by activating this transcription factor, retinoic acid receptor, which upregulates the expression of genes that um, induce uh, differentiation, cell cycle arrest, and apoptosis, depending on the cancer cell type that you're looking at, and overall results in growth inhibition. And if you look at uh, a cell cultured model of mammary carcinoma, these are MCF7 mammary carcinoma cells, you indeed find that activation of RAR by retinoic acid induces cell cycle arrest. So you can see this is the cell cycle distribution. Retinoic acid induces accumulation at G1 at the expense of SSG2M, so the cell is arrested at G1. And if you wait somewhat longer, the cell undergoes apoptosis. 
And we could trace these activities to several uh, target genes for RAR, which are upregulated in response to retinoic acid. And here are two of them. So here is caspase 9, key player in apoptosis. You treat the cells with retinoic acid, caspase 9 is upregulated. Here is BTG2, it's a cell cycle regulator, which actually controls the expression of cyclin D, thereby inducing cell cycle arrest. You treat the cell with retinoic acid, uh, BTG2 expression goes up. If you also overexpress the binding protein that cooperates with RAR in regulating gene expression, in this case CRABP2, you see that the binding protein enhances the ability of RAR to upregulate the expression of these genes. And this is manifested very beautifully, very beautifully if you look at the overall biological response of these cells to retinoic acid. And so this is just a, a, um, a cell growth experiment. You're treating the cells with increasing concentration of retinoic acid, and the cell undergo growth inhibition. If you knock out the binding protein from these cells, they become extremely resistant to retinoic acid. On the other hand, if you overexpress CRAP2 in these cells, they become exquisitely sensitive to retinoic acid-induced growth inhibition. And so this is sort of important because I told you retinoic acid is being used in the clinic, but there are two problems with retinoic acid therapy. One is the compound is highly toxic at pharmacological doses, as you might imagine. The second is the tumors develop retinoic acid resistance. And so the observation that CRABP2 can dramatically sensitize cells to retinoic acid-induced growth inhibition suggests that this protein may act as a tumor suppressor and may allow uh, for treatment with retinoic acid at, extreme, uh, at like three orders of magnitude lower concentration in a non-toxic range and may also overcome the retinoic acid resistance of some tumors. And so, of course, you cannot ask these questions in the context of cultured cells, so we went to an animal model. Okay. So the animal model we chose to use is a transgenic mouse called the NNTV mammary carcinoma mouse model. This animal has been engineered to overexpress the growth factor receptor new in mammary tissue specifically, or almost specifically. And as a result of overexpression of this growth factor receptor, uh, these mice uh, grow a mammary tumor spontaneously. Okay, so this is the kind of data you get from these animals. This is you go and measure tumor volume as a function of time, and you can see uh, day zero is when the tumor reaches a size that you can measure about half a centimeter. Then you follow tumor growth. You can also follow a survival uh, uh, path. And survival in this uh, experiment, let me just explain, we don't wait for the animals to die. Uh, when the tumor reaches a size of 1.5 to two centimeter in diameter, we terminate the experiment. So that's what survival means. And we made three transgenic mouse models. One of them is uh, um, an MMTV new mouse with uh, heterozygous for CRABP2. So this will grow tumors about like that. Then we made a mouse that overexpresses new in mammary tissues, but is knocked out completely for CRABP2. And then we made a mouse that is uh, overexpresses new and grows tumors, but also overexpresses CRABP2 specifically in mammary tissue. And so varying the expression level of CRABP2 in these tumors, we thought would allow us to see if CRABP2 acts as a tumor suppressor in vivo. And so here are the data. And so here is tumor volume over time. The black line shows the control. The green line shows what happens in animals that completely lack the binding protein. And here is the red line, is uh, what happens in an animal that overexpresses the binding protein in mammary tissue. And you can easily see that overexpressing CRABP2 in mammary tissue uh, very dramatically delays tumor growth in these animals, suggesting that indeed it's a tumor suppressor. In fact, if you look at the survival uh, curve, animals that overexpress CRABP2 in mammary tissue survive to 650 days, right? This is like two years. And, and at least and, and two animals out of the 11 in the group did not develop tumors at all at this time. Now, this is uh, in, in, con in, in contrast with the control animals, 100% of which always develop tumors. Okay. Now, uh, nicely enough, we could show that this 
is, uh, this activity is emerging from the ability of retinoic acid to activate RAR in vivo and the same target genes that we identified in the, in the cells play in vivo and so caspase 9 is upregulated by CRABP2, so is BTG2, the cell cycle regulated, and cyclin D1 is downregulated. Okay. And then we ran into a surprise. And so it turns out that if you just take MMTV new animals and you treat them with retinoic acid, retinoic acid induces a higher rate of proliferation of the tumors. This is completely unexpected. So this suggests that in, in this system, retinoic acid does not induce growth inhibition. In fact, it's a, prolifer it's a proliferation response, right? So this is a conundrum. And it's also of concern because we're treating people with retinoic acid, okay? And so if you look in the literature, you find that this is not the first time this has been pointed at. And so it's been reported that retinoic acid uh, can enhance skin tumor formation. It's been reported that topical administration of retinoic acid induces hyperproliferation of keratinocyte. So that's hyperproliferative activity. It's also been reported, this is from Pierre Chambon's lab, that although retinoic acid is essential for maintenance of skin integrity, uh, this activity does not require RAR. All RAR-mediated signaling pathways are dispensable in the epidermis. And so we have a problem. And so we walked around with, with this mystery, right? So these data suggest that retinoic acid can be anti-carcinogenic or pro-carcinogenic, depending on, 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 the, on the system, right? And so we walked around until a, go a golden, fortuitous moment dropped in our lap. And so a, a student in the lab who was interested in PPARS uh, carried out a transcriptional activation experiment to find out ligands that activate PPARS. And she used retinoic acid as a negative control because we were very sure the retinoic acid, which activates RER, will not have any activity in the system. And to her surprise, she found the retinoic acid very potently activates a particular isotype of PPAR, PPAR delta, does not activate alpha or gamma. So let me tell you about PPAR delta. In keratinocytes, it has been shown that some target genes for PPAR delta induce the expression of survival pathways. And so PPAR delta upregulates the expression of PDK1, a kinase that phosphorylates a um, um, protein known as AKT1 or ACT1, which is a key uh, a player in, in allowing the cells to survive, okay? So survival is sort of a pro-proliferative kind of an activity. And so we went to find out whether in this same system, in keratinocytes, retinoic acid can function as a PPAR delta ligand. And we indeed found that just like a synthetic ligand that activates PPAR delta, retinoic acid induces the expression of PDK1, induces the phosphorylation of AKT, and protects these cells from apoptosis. So this is an apoptosis measure. You treat the cells with TNF-alpha, which is a potent apoptosis inducer, and it induces apoptosis. You treat the cells with a PPAR delta ligand or with retinoic acid, protects the cell. And so in keratinocytes, retinoic acid functions like a PPAR delta ligand and not like an RER ligand. And the question comes about why in keratinocytes it's a PPAR delta ligand, and in mammary carcinoma cells it's an RER ligand. So that brings us back to binding proteins. So it turns out that uh, CRABP2 indeed cooperates with RER in delivery of ligand. PPAR delta also has a cooperating binding protein. It's called FABP5. The old name is keratinocyte FABP. It's very highly expressed in keratinocytes. And so is, is uh, this binding protein involved in the ability of retinoic acid to activate P. pardella? Well, one criteria is whether retinoic acid, to go and see if retinoic acid will mobilize this protein to the nucleus. And the other, the answer is yes, it does. This is uh, FABP5. Treat with retinoic acid, it goes to the nucleus. So P. pardella ligand will induce its location. Retinoic acid will also. Just a regular fatty acid which binds will not. You could also show that FABP5 enhances the ability of retinoic acid to activate PPAR delta. So this is a transcriptional activation assay. Treat with retinoic acid, PPAR delta activity goes up. If you also overexpress the binding protein, activity is much enhanced. And so now we have two binding proteins that work 
in conjunction with retinoic acid. FABP5 uh, functions to uh, enable PPAR delta to uh, respond to retinoic acid, and CRABP2 enables RAR to respond to retinoic acid. And so we were wondering if these binding proteins are key in regulating the ability of retinoic acid to channel to RAR versus to PPAR delta. Okay, so we went back to the carotinocytes and we looked at the expression level of the protein. So you can see in carotinocytes, CRABP2 expression is quite low. Expression of FABP5 is pretty high. Um, and we were wondering if switching the expression levels of these two proteins will change the biological responses to retinoic acid. And so we could switch it by uh, either overexpressing CRAP2 or knocking down FABP5. And so this is what you see. This is the PPAR delta uh, uh, target genes, PDK1, whose ex expression I showed you before is upregulated in these cells by retinoic acid. But if you overexpress CRABP2 or underexpress FABP5, this uh, uh, activity is completely uh, abolished. Now, as a result of this, uh, switching the expression level of the binding proteins uh, completely switches the biological activity of retinoic acid in this cell. So here is the keratinocyte. I showed this before. If you treat the cells with the apoptosis inducer, TNF-alpha, they undergo apoptosis. If you treat them with retinoic acid, it protects the cells from apoptosis. But if you switch the expression level of the binding protein, uh, for example, by overexpression of CRABP2, retinoic acid now enhances the apoptosis response instead of protecting from apoptosis. Now you see the opposite in the mammary carcinoma cells. And so um, uh, MCF7 cells express a high level of CRABP2 and a pretty low level uh, of FABP5. And uh, as I showed you before, in these cells, you treat them with retinoic acid, it induces cell cycle arrest in part by downregulating cycling D2. Uh, D2. If you switch the expression level of the binding protein, the ability of retinoic acid to function through RAR is completely abolished. And again, switching the, the, the expression level of the binding protein completely uh, um, con uh, converts these cells, um, completely switches the biological responses of these cells to retinoic acid. And so in MCF7 cells, normally you treat them with uh, uh, retinoic acid. It's a pro-apoptotic agent. So here is an apoptosis inducer trail, and here is trail plus retinoic acid. But if you switch the uh, expression level of the binding protein, retinoic acid now protects from apoptosis. Okay. And so that brings us to this overall scheme. Uh, retinoic acid, very surprisingly, appears to function by regulating the expression of not one but two nuclear receptors. The partitioning between the two nuclear receptors depends on the expression of particular intracellular lip lipid binding proteins and result with oppo in opposing biological activity. So RER induces growth inhibition while PPAR delta induces proliferation. Okay. And on a final note, I just want to point out that if you go back to the MMTV new mice and you look at the relative expression level of these binding proteins, you find that in a normal mammary tissue, CRABP2 is highly expressed, but upon tumor formation, it is completely silenced. On the other hand, FABP5 is very, uh, shows a low expression level, but it's uh, significantly upregulated uh, in the tumor. And so uh, tumor regenesis in this mammary carcinoma uh, um, model is accompanied by a switch in the binding protein expression profile. And so that brings about a number of interesting questions. For example, is uh, uh, switching of the binding protein expression level um, a general feature of tumor formation, or is this a specific feature of this cancer? And also, it brings about the possibility that looking at expression level of binding protein may serve as a diagnostic tool because if you have a tumor in which FABP5 is highly expressed, you probably do not want to treat this patient with retinoic acid. Okay. And finally, uh, this suggests novel uh, uh, um, targets for therapy because if you could antagonize FABP5, for example, you could overcome uh, retinoic acid resistance. And so I want to stop here and just thank the people who, who did all of this work. So the works on PPAR Delta and FABP5 were done by FAD 
Dean, Natasha Schoen, an undergraduate student at Cornell. The RER CRABP2 uh, work were done by these students and structure function studies of FABP5 and CRABP2 were carried out by Steve Ayers and Richard Sessler. And I also want to thank my collaborator, Alexander Nikitin, who's been helping us with the mouse models, and Richard Gilliland, who has been helpful in the crystal structure. receptors are very different from non-steroid receptors because they are not on the DNA in the absence of ligand. So estrogen receptor may be nuclear, but glucocorticoid receptor is completely cytosolic, right? And the, they're sequestered in chaperone kind of complexes, right? And so I don't know that they will need a binding protein to deliver the hormone to them because it's sort of a different mechanism. But it's possible, of course, but I, I Let just me ask don't know. Yeah. Question, uh, you, you showed that um, the thiazolidine thion drug, uh, tro troglitazone, uh, not only found that activated uh, FAB. Um, it's clear within that chemical class of thiazolidine thions, there are different levels of what is called an agonism. And I wondered if you had looked. Uh, not only at proglitazone, but at other members of yeah, the same so, TCB class. Yeah, like pyolidazone. In fact, you know, troglitazone itself has been taken off the market. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so, right, but it's, that's yeah, the ligand yeah, we but, had. We have so not nice looked at other ones. Between the level of intrinsic activity of these TCBs and perhaps differential effects of the level of Yeah, so it's a really good question. We have not done this, and it's sort of in the queue. Okay. We, we are going to, because it's really an interesting question. So. Yeah. But once you have an event that occurs and you get ligand binding, you get transcriptional say activation of a gene, what is it known what the rate limiting step is for keeping that gene on? Do you need continued uh, recycling or do you have to wait for some negative regulator? Okay. So so you just walked into a highly <coughs> controversial area, right? I think that the, the the general wisdom at the moment is that the off switch for nuclear receptor activity is a physical degradation of the receptor and has nothing to do with the ligand. So at least in RER, what happens is, okay, retinoic acid binds, you kick in transcription, the receptor then gets phosphorylated, then it gets ubiquitinated, and then it gets degraded. And if it doesn't get degraded, it stops being active because of all of these modifications. And so the switch, the off switch is not at the level of the hormone. The rate of degradation, is that different then within different cell types, depending on the specific? So it, it's different on different receptors, and it's different on different, right? So, and this is very new. So apparently there's a prote proteasomal subunit that actually binds to the modified receptor still on the DNA, and then kicks in it, right? It's, it's a complex and not completely understood area. Yeah. So have you looked at the um, expression of these binding proteins in other types of tumor, tumors like ERBC positive, or I'm um, sorry, ER positive tumors versus the ERBC? So we have not looked at human tumors. Ruth Carey, bless her heart, looked across uh, um, multiple cell lines, okay? And she finds uh, from, from that uh, bioinformatics exercise that these two proteins are in a seesaw in all of these cells. 
So when one is up, the other one is down, and the more malignant ones have more HDP5. So at least in, mammar in cultured mammary carcinoma cells, it appears to hold. I don't know in other cancers, and I don't know in human tumors yet. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, have you looked at the expression, relative expression uh, levels of HER2 new uh, after uh, the uh, retinoic acid treatment in the, in the mouse, in the mice, does it actually increase? We, we have, have not done that. Because uh, EGF has, EGF receptors have been shown to be increased in several systems, uh, contributing to the uh, proliferative response uh, by retinoic acid. And, and then the other question I have is whether PP, PPAR delta actually activates or induces the level of the EGF receptor. Uh, yeah, so you, these are all great questions. It's been reported, for example, the PPAR delta, uh, one of the direct targets for PPAR delta is VGF. I don't know about new specifically, right? And so it has a variety of proliferative repertoire, but uh, you know, it, it might be depending on the cell context and such. We have not looked at that yet. You show that, that these fatty acid binding proteins can bind <coughs> ligands. Have you looked to see whether you can, with, with a compound, selectively block one protein uh, versus the other? Right, and, and so, so this, is an, uh, this is a complex question, because what do you do with a protein that binds everything, right, but is only activated by very selective compounds? And so we sort of are hoping that we would be able to design an antagonist, for example, for FABP5, right? But it may be easier to design an antagonist directly to the receptor if that's what you want to do, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Now, I do want to point out that PPARs are in the same conundrum because they, too, will bind every lipid molecule that will slow it in, but will only be activated by specific compounds. So. Yeah, so I don't know, in fact, which one will be an easier target, but it's a really great challenge. Yeah. Uh, with respect to the PPAR delta, are you arguing that FADP is linked uh, the retinoid gas ligand to the RSR uh, partner or to the delta itself? It for sure does nothing to do with RXR. This is a delta itself, for sure. We are very certain of that. And we have, you know, like a book, because of course that's immediately the question. It's a retinoic acid. So, so the, the, the easy answer is to tell you that RxR does not bind all transretinoic acid. It will only bind the night cis isomer. These are, this is all all trans. But we also. Well, they will bind everything. Will they get mobilized into the nucleus in response to night cis retinoic acid? We haven't looked. But we know that the effect is directly on the PPAR. Yeah. So is the PDK1 uh, effect direct uh, or is there activation of the PFA kinase as well? Or can it be like by the PPAR? So it has been reported, and that's not our work, this is the work of Walter Wally over in Switzerland, has shown that PDK1 is a direct target for, P, for, for PPAR delta. Also, ILK is a direct target for PPAR delta. Okay, I don't know the whole list. We will one of these days run an expression array analysis, but we haven't done that yet. No, I do not. I stay away from PML whenever possible. Yeah, and so I be <laughs> for for an emotional response. <laughs> so, but you know, it's a good point. I probably should look. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do they have any lipid specificity or they define any lipids? So, yeah, there are tables in which people have asked this question, right? And they threw like 20 lipids at these binding proteins and they bind. The only exception to this, and it's really a minor <laughs> exception, is brain FADP likes docosahexaenoic acid more than it likes other fatty acids. So this is a lipid, this is right at 22 uh, fatty acid with six unsaturations, and it's very enriched in brain. But that doesn't mean it won't bind other, other things, it would just have a like two-fold higher affinity for this one, right? They will bind anything. Yeah. 
So this is a very great question. Do they have functions other than, than uh, delivering to the nucleus and to, and to a particular research? So as I said, they've been known for 30 years. Nobody knows. But then, you know, people don't know how to look. If you look at cellular retinol binding protein, a member of this family, it is quite well established that that's exactly what this protein does. It delivers retinol to enzymes that metabolize them, right? Probably by direct protein protein extract that hasn't been shown. Yeah, but yeah, right. So they might have cytosolic function that are distinct. <coughs> right. Right. Okay. Thank you.